Glory to God. Glory to God. I tell you right there, if, if, if something like that don't touch your soul, we need to take you to the doctor. And you need to, you need to get checked out because I know all of us in here are not so perfect that you can't remember where God found you, where God came and got you from. You weren't always sister so-and-so and brother so-and-so. Some of y'all can say, preacher, I was a mess. Preacher, I was down on my luck. Preacher, my back was against the wind, but I was that one that the Lord came and found me and the Lord has did a change in my life and guess what now God in heaven to sign my name if you ain't got nothing else that you can give God a praise for you can praise God that your name has been written down in the Lamb's book of life God is wonderful church God is wonderful and that is why we're here this moment to identify with the fact that God is good. And God is not just good sometimes, but he's good how often? And all the time. Amen. Look at somebody this morning and say, neighbor, God loves you. And I do too. And if you love me as much as I love you, then nothing can break. I love him too. Amen. Amen. So good to see those of you in our midst that are visiting with us this morning. God bless you. We're so glad to have you here with us. As always, we're thankful for those of you that are watching us via live stream on this morning. God bless you. We thank you for tuning in with us here on this morning. And prayerfully, something will be said that can be a blessing unto your life. I would have each of you to know that the word of God can do a lot for you if you will let the word do a lot for you. Now that we are a hard-hearted type of individual and we don't want to let God do any type. Because here's the thing, in order for the word to take effect, in your life, God will have to do some operation on you. Because in order for God to come in, that means that that stuff that's on the inside got to get up out of there. Amen. I'm preaching already. Somebody get ready to do the invitation. So, so, uh, so you, God got to come in and he got to take that stuff up out of there. He got to take the bad stuff out so that he can put the good stuff in. God got to take the hate out so he can put love in. God got to take the malice out so he can put love in and things of that nature. God got to do some operation on us. So I'm praying this morning that God will do some operation on somebody that he'll meet you where you are but he won't leave you the same way that he met you amen did anybody come to hear a word from the lord on this morning i believe you came to the right place we'll be in the gospel uh, according to saint luke uh, chapter number seven beginning at verse number one and concluding at verse number 10 the grass withers and the flower thereof shall fade away but the word of god shall stand forever. Luke chapter 7, beginning at verse number 1. If you see Genesis, you're in the wrong place. <laughs> now when he had entered all, ended all his sayings in the audience of the people, he entered into Capernaum. And a certain centurion servant who was dear to him was sick and ready to die. And when he heard of Jesus, he sent unto him the elders of the Jews, beseeching him that they would come and heal his servant. And when they came to Jesus, they besought him instantly, saying that he was worthy for him, for he should do this. For he loves our nation, and he has built us a synagogue. Then Jesus went with him, and when he was now not far from the house, the centurion sent friends unto him saying, Lord, in other words, don't even trouble yourself. For you, I am not even worthy that you should even come into my house. Wherefore, well, neither thought I myself worthy to even come out to meet you. But Lord, if you just say the word, somebody missed their shout. He said, Lord, if you would just say the word, my servant will be healed for I am also a man set under thought he got to call his road now y'all having under me soldiers and I say unto one go and he goes and to another comes and he comes and my servant do this and he does it and when Jesus heard these things this is the first time you ever read this right here Jesus marveled 
and turned him about and said unto the people that followed him, I say unto you, I have not found so great a faith, no, not in Israel. And they that were sent, returning to the house, found the servant whole that had been sick. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart, the Lord, be acceptable in thy sight. If you would, let, me go, let us go to our Heavenly Father in prayer. Dear wise and gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you this day. Father, first of all, I thank you for being God and being God all by yourself. Father, I thank you for your word, for it is a lamp unto our feet and is a light unto our path. Father, I pray that through the preaching of your word this morning, Father, that somebody will be drawn into a closer relationship with you. Father, may that wavering soul, Father, that does not know their direction, find direction, Father, through your holy word. And Father, if you do this for us, we'll be so ever mindful to glorify you and to give you the praise. In Jesus' name we say it. Let us all say amen. amen. It says this morning, I want to talk to you all about what faith can do for you. Amen. I didn't say hope. I want to talk about what it is that faith can do in your life. Now, this amazing story that we just read, it happened as Jesus has just walked off of preaching what we can really say is probably his most famous sermon that he would ever preach. And that was the Sermon on the Mount or the sermon of what we know as the Beatitudes. He had just taught one of the great things of the message, and that was to love your neighbors, to do good to those that oppress you. And now he walks off of that sermon platform in the mountains of the northern part of Jerusalem. He walks into his hometown of Capernaum, and the elders of Israel come and they say, go to this Roman soldier's house and pray for his servant. Pray for him because he loves his country. Pray for him because he's given a lot of money. He's given us a lot of resources and he has built us a synagogue and he's not even one of us. He's a Gentile. He's a Roman soldier, a part of the people who are oppressing us and who are absolutely overstepping over and on us. And we are under their dominion and their control. And Jesus had just taught them love your enemies. Jesus had just taught, pray for those that do you wrong. And now it's kind of like, I guess I just taught it. I might as well go and give them an example of what it looks like. But it's interesting that the thing they came out and said, Lord, he's worthy of a miracle. Because why? He loves our nation. Number one, we ought to love Israel. What do I mean by Israel? We ought to love the church. And number two, and he's built our church. He's given us a lot of resources and we wouldn't have our synagogue without this man using the resources that he has. And a synagogue was just where the law was taught. It's just where the morality and the morals of the Old Testament were taught. The Ten Commandments were taught. The five books of the Old Testament were taught. And he liked that. He liked that better than the religion of the Roman people. And what I want you to understand is there's three quick things that cause this man to stand out. This is what faith can do in your life. That's what I'm preaching. This is what faith can do in your life. This man had three things that caught the attention of Jesus and it left Jesus marveling. You got to be something special if you leave Jesus marveling. The word marvel means to be astonished. The word marvel means to be not just astonished, but it means to be simply amazed and to stand in awe. One translation said it just takes your breath away. Can you imagine God in the skin of a human man, veiled in flesh, was so moved, not by a preacher, not by a disciple, not by a rabbi, not by a scholar of the Torah, not by somebody who did great miracles, yes, yes. but by a man that wasn't even religious. Yes, 
exercised so much faith in what Jesus, who, who he was and what he was able to do that Jesus said, you know what? I'm not impressed with titles. I'm not impressed with your religion. And I don't, I'm not impressed with how many scriptures you can quote and how many praise songs that you can sing that you don't really mean because you really don't believe that God can really do anything beyond the normal. But when he saw a non-religious man look at him and say, Lord, don't come into my house. Some of us would have been trying to invite him in. They said, he's worthy. But he said, I'm not worthy. And the closer I get to you, because as Jesus started getting close to his house, the closer you get to Jesus, anything in you that's proud and anything in you that's arrogant and anything in you that says, I'm worthy, look at me, I'm wonderful, God ought to bless me. I don't understand why you haven't answered my prayer. I did this, I gave my time, I did that, I did this. But the closer you get to Jesus, the more you see your own sinfulness. And the more you are able to see his holiness and the more you understand I'm not worthy you are the lamb of God that was slain and everything I get I deserve only your blood and the cross and the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ Amen. we don't deserve anything but he gives us everything well I've been going to church all these years and God just ought to do something for me you don't deserve anything all of our righteousness, the Bible says, is but filthy rags. But when you look at him and say, his blood deserves a miracle. His blood deserves me sacrificing myself. His suffering on the cross absolutely is worthy of me living my life for him. Worthy is the Lamb of God. And when this man, church, a non-religious man said, when Jesus was getting close to his house, notice it said that he, he loved Israel. The Bible says that he loved Israel. What kind of person marvels Jesus? Astonishes Jesus. Number one, a person got to have love for Israel. He loved Israel. He loved it. It was the center of his life. We ought to make the church the center of our life. It ought to be something about the Lord's body that makes us want to be in the Lord's presence. We ought to make it to church. It's still something that we ought to put at the forefront of our life. A centurion church was someone who was over at least a hundred soldiers. They had at least a hundred soldiers under him. A centurion in the Roman army was someone who was not allowed to be married. Well, when he was elevated to that position, it meant that he would give up the right to be married and have a family because he knew eventually he was going to be sent to some foreign soil because the Roman Empire was ever expanding and he would be required to stay and be stationed at a place for maybe up to 20 years, leaving his family by themselves. And so servants and people that he took with him became like family to them often. One commentator said that they were like family. And so when one of his servants whom he loved got sick, you got to understand the way he felt about them because they were like his family. And so when one of his servants got sick and Jesus was astonished and marveled at this man because of his love for the servant. But secondly, because of his humility. Because the elder said, he's worthy, Lord, for you to go into his house and to do a miracle. But the man said in the text, I don't even feel worthy to come out of my house and meet you. Right. Let alone for you to come into my house. And now that you're coming to me, I don't even feel worthy to even come out of the door. I, I got a sneak of some suspicion. He probably was thinking to himself, I got altars and images and statues to God and I'm burning incenses and giving blood sacrifices just like all of the other Romans did. They are all in my home. They are all out in my yard. They're out there in my garden. I'm worshiping all kinds of gods and he is a holy God. This is God in the flesh coming into my house. 
That's humility, church. Humility says, Lord, I'm not worthy, but you're more than worthy. And, and, and he had a great faith, the Bible talks about. And when Jesus approached his house, they told him what the man said. He said, Lord, if you will just say the word, my servant will be healed. And I really wish that we as people of God could get our faith to the level that we don't have to see anything God does. But just because God has already said it in his word, that's a check that we know that's good enough for us to take down to the bank in his cash because God's word is good. We ought to get out of the place where if we don't see evidence of God doing things, well, well God must not be working. God must not be moving. Man, you talking, that just lets you know that God is moving in your life. You thinking and you being active, that lets you know that God is working in your life but your problem is you waiting on that new car before you want to give God a praise you waiting on that new house you waiting on a promotion before you learn how to give God a praise but the Bible says blessed be the God who loves us daily with benefits what kind of benefits food on your table that's a benefit clothes on your back that's a benefit gas in your tank that's a benefit every day of our life we'll receive benefits from the Lord this man astonished Jesus with his faith the only time church that God almighty marvel is when he saw a non-religious man recognize who he was and the Bible says that it took his breath away for a moment, it had him son. It astounded him. And God, Jesus, marveled. He stepped back and said, you know what, man? Out of all them folk that I done healed, ain't none of them had a faith like this. All of them folk that was lined up with 10 fall at the fish fry that I did, none of them. None of them had a faith like this. Out of all the people that I've opened their eyes, that I've unstopped their deaf ears, none of them have ever had a faith like this. Because guess what? Their faith had not reached the level that they could believe God for the impossible. But I don't know about y'all, church, but I serve a God that the Bible says that he is able to do, not just the bare minimal, but he is able to do what? Exceeding and abundant. That means more and even more than you can ever ask for. I'm expecting God for this, but God said, you know what? I'm not going to do that because eyes have not seen, nor ear heard, nor has it even entered into your heart what I really want to do in your life. Tell somebody, you need to take up your expectations. You need to take up your expectations. A lot of us, we already got into a routine, man. I get up, I go to work, I go home. I get up, I go to work, I go home. Friday, I got a payday. You are, but you, when you are a child of God, you ought to live like those movies that when you get to the end of the movie, it says, stay tuned. That just lets you know that it's over with for right now, but something else is on the way. And as a child of God, you ought to live like that. Stay tuned. I can't wait. Hold on just a minute. I know that this setback is not going to be permanent, but this setback is just momentary. And after a while, God is going to bless me so good that I ain't even able to stand it. And the Bible says... And it took his breath away. The only thing that can make God be astonished and stun God and marvel God is for a mere man to recognize who he is. But do you know that even when we have people that recognize who Jesus is, that there's always somebody around that's not excited that they recognize who Jesus was? Let's take a trip. Follow me over. Y'all remember there was a woman that had a, a box of very expensive perfume. Uh, of spikenard is what the Bible called it. It, it was very costly. Uh, probably worth about a year's worth of wages. 
And this woman, when she found herself in the presence of Jesus, wasn't like everybody else. Everybody else trying to sit at the table and have a conversation with him. Everybody else, well, I got this back pain. I got this neck pain. I need you to do something about this. I need you to do something about that. But this one woman that had this very expensive bottle of perfume, she wasn't trying to be all up in his face. She wasn't doing all of that. The Bible says she was down on her knees. She had broken that expensive bottle and she had anointed the feet of Jesus. Jesus, and she had begun to wipe his feet with her hand. In essence, she was saying, I'm in the presence of God. I ain't got no other choice but to bless him. I'm in the presence of God. I ain't got no other choice but to give him the glory, but to give him the honor. And that's the same way we ought to be when we come into the house of God. You ought not sit there like God owe you something, like you had to come here this morning if it had not been for the Lord that was on your side. You would have been consumed a long time ago. But this woman is wiping the feet of Jesus, and here you got the folk around her. Why are you breaking? Why are you doing all that? Why are you doing all that? I, 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 all I got is a little of that, what they call that stuff, uh, the stuff, the axe. All I got is a little axe. It cost me $2. I got it from the dollar store. And here you come in here with this expensive bottle of spike nard. You trying to outdo me? That's the problem. You ought not have your mind on how I'm praising God and how I'm giving God the glory. Because the last time I checked, my worship and my praise to God is a personal thing. That ain't got nothing to do with you. That's between me and my father. And you can so easily judge me because of my actions. But you weren't there when God dried my tears. You were not there when I had my back up against the wall and I didn't have nobody that I could depend on and God had to come and pick me up. And if you were not there, don't say nothing when I give God a praise. He is worthy to be praised. From the rising of the sun until the setting of the same, the name of the Lord is worthy to be praised. She said, you know what? I can't help but to give him glory. But the people that were around her were not non-religious people. These were religious folk. Ah, God, can I tell you something? That most of the opposition that you get will not come from without, but it's going to come from within. I never understood how we can be in the house of God giving God praise, and you got folk in there just sitting there like you've been looking on, sucking on lemons and like, like you got some tart in your mouth, like your mouth twisted. Or something like that. When, and, and, and somebody else, you don't know, you don't know that person just had a hellish week all week long. And they just couldn't wait to get into the house of God. But you sitting over there like a bump on the law, like God ain't never did anything. And just because somebody else wants to testify about the goodness of God, you got a problem with it. I want to solve something real quick for us. For a lot of us saying that stuff caused us to stumble. Is it really that it causes you to stumble? Or is it really that you don't like it? Because for all of my NFL fans in here, what my NFL fans in, okay? If you are an NFL fan, you recognize that there is a penalty that they have called excessive celebration. Ah, God, there's a penalty that they call excessive celebration. What does that mean? That means that you can be fined or potentially penalized for celebrating too much after a touchdown or after a reception or something like that. But the only thing about it is that it's subjective. Meaning that one referee can look at it and say, oh man, that ain't nothing. But another referee can look at it and say, oh, that's too much. Y'all planned that. But we ought to get to the point where we recognize all of us have been deputized as Christians, not as church police. So if it is true that God has not done anything for you, you ain't got to clap, you ain't got to say amen, you ain't got to bump, you ain't got to do nothing. But on the other hand, if the Lord has been good to you, let the redeemed 
of the Lord say so. He's worthy, church. He's worthy of it, church. That's why you got to give it to him because he's worthy. He said in his word, if you ain't got sense enough to praise him, there's some rocks out there on the side of the road. They got sense enough to recognize that God has been good to them and they'll give God the glory. They'll give God the glory. Oh, God. There's only one God that, you know, sometimes you just got to take a moment and just give God the glory. Sometimes you just got to give it to him, church. God marveled. God marveled. The same God that made the world, he marveled. The one that made the stars, he marveled. The one that set the sun out there, where he marveled. He was impressed when somebody recognized who he was. It blew his mind. When God got ready to take credit for creation and what he had did, and he wanted to mention, he said, I made the stars too. That's what he did. He used five words. He said, I made the stars also. No big deal. I just made stars. I created all the living things. And by the way, just a footnote, I made the stars also. That's how big and bad I am. So nothing in the universe can make God marvel because he made it. But when a man or a woman, when a mother, when a dad, when any person gets to the point and say, you know what, I believe that Jesus Christ is the son of God. I believe that he died for my sins. I believe that he got up on the third day with all power in his hands. We astonish God. The sea part in God. The water walking God. That's the one that we are astonished. So you mean to tell me the Red Sea became like jello? He was not astonished. A donkey opened his mouth and preached to the prophet of Balaam. And he was not marveled. A whale swallowed a man for three days and spit him up. Came out looking like a raisin with no hair shriveled up. Preaching, ain't had no eyebrows. Looked like all the asses had eaten it away. And he was not marvel. A bush burning and lighting up the wilderness. And all he said was, take your shoes off. Moses understood what you had to do. When you come into the presence of God. Moses said, you know what? And I got to do it, y'all. Moses said, you know what? I can't even keep them on. Because the place where I'm standing. God is here. The place where I am standing. is holy ground. You remember. When the man by the name of Sennacherib, Jehoshaphat, got that letter from Sennacherib, the evil king. And he said, you know what? I got 600 chariots of iron. I'm going to run all over you. And he sent in that letter. And the man took that letter and he took it up into the temple. Put it out on the altar. And he looked up to heaven and said, God, we got mail. Because you put me here. And I know you're good. And I know you're faithful. And I know that you love me. And I don't understand why they are trying to attack me. And I don't really understand this letter. So since I can't do anything with it. It's yours God. It belongs to you. Take, he told Jehoshaphat said, take the praise singers. Tell them to go out there and get on the front line. And don't send any weapons with them. Just go down there. He said, with the tambourine and with the harp. He said, give them a violin. Do all of that. He said, all I want you to do is give God the glory. Can you hear him now? Blessed be the God. And his mercy 
endures forever. From generation to generation. They got somebody coming after them trying to destroy them. And they're saying great is the mercy of the Lord. His mercy endures forever from generation to generation. And can I tell you, church, it will benefit us to get into the practice that when the devil is coming after us, seeking to destroy us, that are always saying, woe is me and this and that. We ought to go at it with a praise on our lips. We ought to go at it with a praise on our mind. We ought to go in it. Blessed be the God. His mercy endures forever and ever. And because his mercy endures forever, I'm going to come out of this Better than I was when I went in. I got all of this. I'm coming out to destroy you. Church, I want to put you on notice today. I don't care what the times bring. I don't care what the culture brings. I don't care what evil brings. Don't care what the Antichrist brings. Bring it on. Greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. And the Bible says that when they got out there and they started praising God, when the praise leaders went out and started praising God, that's why, that's what we're doing. It's more church than just the loud singing and all of this. While you're trying to soak it all in, sometimes you don't understand that there's somebody maybe in our midst got trouble in the home. You will never know it because they don't tell their business like you tell yours. Some people in here, if you could know what they were dealing with, you would weep for them. You would cry. Some, some, some people are dealing with some things so strong, church, you just want to, you didn't, wouldn't even have words for them. All you would want to do is just walk up to them and say, you know what, I just want, I just want to embrace you. I just want to give you a hug because you know what? I don't have words to help you through your situation, but I do know a God that is able to help you to get through your situation. And the church got to get back to the place to where we stop talking about people and we learn how to be there for one another because it may be me today, but it could be you tomorrow. Everybody want to talk about somebody's issue everybody want to talk about look how she fell what caused them to fall but nobody wants to be there to intercede for anybody nobody wants to be there to stand in the gap but when it's you you want everybody and their mama on their knees praying Is your faith at the level of church this morning that you can believe God beyond today? Is your faith at the level of church that even though you're going through insurmountable trouble in your life, your faith is still in God? Your faith is still in Jesus. Can I tell y'all, things are going to try your faith. Somebody say, preacher, you ain't telling me that. I don't know it's being tried right now. Matter of fact, preacher, why are you hanging out? I'm about to lose it right now. I'm about to pull it out. I don't. Lord, I don't know how much more. Any of y'all ever said that and then had to take some more? Oh, I know somebody here say, you know what, Lord, I can't get, I can't do it no more. And as soon as you said it, he had to get right back up. And continue to do it. That's the good fight of faith. That's the good fight of faith. That's why Paul was able to say at the end of his life, I kept the faith. What does he mean he kept the faith? Because his faith was tried almost every single day of his life on every hand. Got trouble coming from the left, trouble coming from the right, from behind him on all sides. He had trouble, but he held on to his faith. We're going to have to do the same thing, church. You're going to have to do the same thing. You're going to have to hold on to your faith. Though them folk on your job gonna run you crazy. 
You're going to have to keep your faith. Or some people in your family are going to cause you to lose your religion. As we say. Some, some, some of us, some of us got to keep the faith. Not against other people, but sometimes against our own self. Because somebody can be real and say, Preacher, I ain't worried about other folk, it's me. I know other folk are after me. I know other people are planning this and doing that and doing this. But when I look in the mirror, I see an individual that knows, but they don't do. I see an individual that has the understanding and the right knowledge, but they just won't apply it. And because I don't do that, I find myself just going through cycles. Never getting out of the cycle. Just going through the same old cycles. And every time I go through the cycle, I'm asking the same question, why am I here? How did I get here? Well, you would have thought you recognized that 10 years ago. But I'm here again. And I'm going through this. And I'm dealing with this. But the only difference is, have you went through it by faith? Faith is the substance of things that we hope for. You can't have faith and not have expectation. Faith is the substance of things that we hope for, and it is the evidence of things that we cannot see. So faith tells me it's going to work out. Faith tells me this is not the end of the story. This is just the end of a chapter. I'm waiting on the next one to come because this can't be it. Faith says, you know what? Even though it didn't happen for me today, there's a tomorrow coming. That's what faith is, church. So don't be weary in your well-doing. For in due season, you're going to reap. You're going to reap harvest, church, if you don't grow weary. Well, well, good. Well, I, I, I can't imagine a farmer that would spend all of his time out there planting that garden but won't go water it. It wouldn't make good sense for a farmer to go out there and to just throw the seeds out there on the ground, but you haven't tilled the garden. Until God does it, church, you got to be making preparations. Am I just going to sit on the sideline? Because, you know, that, that, that's where, and I tell you, I believe a large portion of people that say they have faith are messed up. Because we thought that all we had to do was get in the water. And now we're just sitting at the dock of the bay, wait, watching the tide roll away. <laughs> Sitting at the dock of the bay, wasting time. But, you know, we just sit back. Sit back. Oh, well, uh, I got baptized. I'm in the church. My ticket already punched. Don't matter that I don't know how to treat people. I'm in the church of Christ. Don't matter that I got a lion spirit. Oh, I'm this and I'm that. But how's your life? Jesus says you will know them by the... Every tree look like a tree. That's good right there. Somebody write that down. Every tree... <laughs> Holy Ghost, every tree look like a tree until the fruit pop out. You thought it was an apple tree, now you got oranges popping up out there. You're gonna have to have faith, church, if you expect to make it through these trying times. And I really wish that we would recognize what is really going on. A lot of things have changed, even over the past. You, you could have told me two years ago that I wouldn't be able to see your beautiful smiles right now as you look at me. Things have changed. And we have to recognize that. But I know one thing that has not, will not change. God won't change. His word won't change. 
His word, he said, is going to be the seal, be the same yesterday, today, and even forevermore. And can I tell you what? Even after this world has been consumed and done away with, his word is still going to be standing. And not only will it be standing, but that's what's going to judge us in the last day. When you stand before God, you know, I'm glad. It ain't going to be like what that show, Who Wants to Be a Millionaire? And, you know, when they reach the point where they may not have known a question, you know, they could phone a friend. Or they had other options. You know, when you're at the gates, you can't phone a friend. I mean, because he's just going to be, as the young generation say, reading you your rights. I mean, he's just going to be telling you what you, I'm just going to be telling you all about yourself. And you're just going to, well, can you call such a, well, well I was there and I did not. Bruh, your name is not on the book, you know. I wish I could help you. But it's members only. That's a different way. <laughs> I never knew you. You work of iniquity, depart from me. Cast into the lake that burneth with fire and with brimstone. I want to put an image in your head. Uh, for any of you that have ever been around a fireplace, an actual fireplace. And you know that sometimes maybe the fire is going out or what have you. They'll take that piece of iron, stick it in the fire and get it right. You know, you can really just take that thing, just sit it in the fire, let it sit there as long as you want. It'll just get hot. That thing will turn fire red. But do it burn up? Imagine that as you. In hell. Not burning up. Never, never being consumed by the fire. But burning. And the Bible says that in that place, the fire is not quenched and the worm dieth not. So not only are the people that are in hell burning, but they have worms eating at their flesh. Well, the Bible tells me that there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. I can even imagine, to begin to imagine the agony and the screams that come from people, probably who had all good intentions of going to heaven, but they didn't make it. Let it not be us, church. Work out your soul salvation. Live for Jesus. It ain't, it ain't that difficult. We make it difficult. Live for Jesus. Serve him. So that you in heaven can lift up your eyes. When they tell me, when they got streets, you know, we like these right here, you know, these folks, they get them through the asphalt, they think they do it so big. We got streets paved with gold. Walls of jasper. Gates of pearl. Y'all, they tell me there's a tree set in the midst of the garden bearing 12 man of fruit. You come in January, we got a fruit for you. You come in February, we got a fruit for you. You come in March, we got a fruit bearing 12 man of fruit. I, I wish the river flowed with water because I might be able to go fishing, but I'm satisfied <laughs> with the river that's flowing with milk and honey. I'm sure there's some fishing that someone will read, we can go catch it. That's what's awaiting those that have great faith. That's what's awaiting those that are made up in their mind. I'm not just going part of the way. I'm going all the way with God. If my mama don't want to go, guess what? I'm going to go if I got to go by myself. Don't you dare let nobody cause you to lose your soul. There are people maybe in our midst right now, you want to obey the gospel, but you're wondering what your folk going to say. Forget them. You got a soul that needs to be saved. And when you stand before God, God is not going to ask you, well, why did you let such and such cause you not to obey the gospel? It's going to be on you. Because that's a decision that you have to make for yourself. But my beloved friends, today that you hear his voice, harden not your heart. He's knocking at somebody's door this morning. Somebody even here in our midst right now that is not a member of the Lord's body. I, want to, I got that question for you. What are you waiting on? Time winding up. What you waiting on? 
Hearse wheels continuing to roll. What you waiting on? You don't know how much time you got left on this earth. Well, you say that, you young, young folk dying too. What the song say, the leaning tree ain't always the first one to fall. People are leaving here. And you are no, we are no better than they are. But God has just given us grace to see another day. To what we didn't get on right on yesterday, he's given us another chance. Maybe somebody need to right some wrongs this morning. You got that opportunity. If you find yourself a guilty distance away from the Lord this morning, don't leave here in that same condition that you find yourself. You need to come to Jesus. If you don't know the Lord is your Savior this morning, come by here in the gospel. You've heard the word of God. Now the question is, do you believe what it is that you've heard? Are you willing to repent of your sins? Are you willing to confess Christ as your Savior? Are you willing to be baptized? for the It might be a little cold, but it's ready. We got the water ready. Are you willing to be baptized for the remission of your sin? And the Lord, the Bible says, will add you to his church. Maybe you're here. You're already a member of the body of Christ, but you're struggling with your faith. Can I tell you, you ain't no different than none of us because every single individual at some point in your life, you struggle with your faith. Maybe you're in that place this morning. Let us pray for you. The Bible says that the prayers of the righteous, they avail as much. Let's go before God. We're in his presence right now, aren't we, church? Amen. And he said, where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty to set you free. No matter what has you bound this morning, you can be set free if you want to be set free. Amen. God is here. He's available to you if you want him. So my brother and my sister, I plead with you. You know what you need to do better than anybody else. Make your decision for God as together we stand and sing the song of invitation. Truly, 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 I would like to take this opportunity to thank you. Thank you for tuning in today and being a part of our worship services. We pray that those things that were said and done on today will benefit and bless into your life, that it will help you to grow as a child of God. If you're ever in our area here in the greater Jacksonville area,